Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcikowski. I am a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It is really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. And today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Daniel Trielli is an assistant professor at Loyola University, Chicago. Tayani Enriquez, a doctoral student at Northwestern University and an affiliate of the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Danielle in just a minute. I am delighted to know, however, that this quarter, our series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Communication Studies, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, and the Program in Latin American and Caribbean Studies. But before we go to the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Korawatomi, and Orawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Fort Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and institutions' history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly a little bit more about how the seminar will unfold. First, Tayani will tell us more about Daniel's research and career. Then Daniel will present his work. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar at any point in time during the seminar. Tayani will moderate. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Tayani, the screen is all yours. Good morning, everyone. Pablo, first of all, thank you for having me as a moderator for today's seminar. It's an absolutely honor for me to present our guest speaker for today. Professor Daniel Trielli, he has a bachelor's degree in journalism from the Sao Paulo Metodista University, a master's degree in journalism from the University of Maryland, and a PhD in media, technology, and society from Northwestern University. Currently, Professor Trielli is an assistant professor in the communication department of Loyola University, Chicago. His research focuses on how news reaches the public in our increasingly algorithmically defined world and how journalists can cover algorithms. Before his life in academia, he was a journalist for about a decade in his native country of Brazil, having published in important Brazilian media outlets, such as the newspaper Folha de São Paulo. In today's seminar, Professor Trielli is going to talk about his work called The Complex System of Algorithmic Media Curation. Algorithmic media curation reflects a complex social technical system that includes human and non-human actors with different motivations, pressures, values, and normative expectations. Any supposed deviation of normative expectations of media distribution emerges from a complex interplay of actors, algorithms, users, and content creators, and must therefore be evaluated as such. In this presentation, he investigates the role of the actors in the system of algorithm, media, and explore two approaches to investigate these systems. We are honored to have Dr. Trielli with us today to share his knowledge and experience. And a quick reminder to our audience, please submit your questions in the Q&A function on Zoom, which is at the bottom of the screen. We will address your questions right after the presentation. So please join me in welcoming Professor Daniel Trielli to the screen. Thank you so much, Tayani. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's a pleasure to be a speaker at the seminar now that I've, uh, some, the seminar that I helped moderate um, a few cycles ago. 
Um, and, and now I'm a faculty affiliate to the center, having been a student affiliate uh, since I think the beginning. Uh, so the things that I'm gonna say today um, are mostly on an essay that I wrote for a forum for journalism and mass communication quarterly that, that was published a couple of months ago. But I thought it would be interesting for this audience because it relates to conceptual and methodological challenges that we might face when we're studying media into, in this new, um, this new digital environment, right, of algorithmic mediation. Um, so if you want to read uh, the full text of this, I'm obviously going to, it's a short read, so I'm going to expand on it a little bit, uh, and I hope to hear questions as well about it, uh, but this is where you find it. Um, and it's hard for me to talk, um, it's, it's hard to me, for me to talk about this research process and this research thoughts that, that I have without going a little bit into the personal tra trajectory that that Tiny mentioned, right? Um, I, I was a journalist in my home country of Brazil uh, for a while. And I graduated from my, uh, from my undergrad in 2005. Um, and this image that I'm showing right now is kind of what we expected are the product of our work to be distributed uh, to, to people, right? Um, obviously, you know, we, we had, color photographs then, and, and the fashions change a little bit. But it was mostly this idea that our journalistic work, um, the output of that work, would be curated only by our own editors and sold directly to our readers in either newsstands or even delivered at their doorsteps. Right? There, were, there might be some you know, commercial frameworks into who owns the newsstands, but the, but the product itself, um, the content itself wouldn't be um, wouldn't undergo any other external curation. At least when I was a journalist, of course, we had moments of censorship in our country and in many countries in Latin America that that did have an external curation of content. Uh, but this wasn't the case, right? Um, and now, of course, this is how journalism and most media is consumed. Uh, the product of our work is atomized into specific news stories or articles or videos that are then recompiled by algorithmic curation. And often that content is competing with non-professional content and different layers of, of professionalism in that content uh, production as well. Um, so before, and I hear talk more about news media, but this can be you know, thought as, as a more variety of media as well. Um, the media reached readers almost directly. Um, the, the, the media content, right? The news content. Um, and now the audiences are actually users of algorithmic systems that mediate this connection, right? So there is this intermediary uh, between the producers and the reader or the audience, right? But this diagram really isn't correct. Um, this is a gross simplification. Here's a less simplified simplification that is a little bit more accurate, um, which is this, right? Algorithmic systems are not just mediating this communications, but they're all actually responding to inputs both by the audience, which now are users of these systems, and the entities that produce content. And that content uh, is curated. Um, it's a curated media, a curated by the algorithm, but the algorithm responds to, to the inputs by both sides, right? Um, and I'm going to go into this a little bit deeper uh, in, uh, in, in my next slides, but overall what this work describes is how media creation is actually the product of a complex social technical system uh, that includes both humans and non-human actors, uh, with different motivations, pressures, uh, values, and expectations, right? The media creation is actually co-constructed by these actors. Uh, now, each of these actors has some expectations of what that curation should look like. Um, but any supposed deviation of those expectations 
actually emerges from the interplay between these actors, right? It doesn't come mainly from one actor or the other. Uh, that's my that's my claim. So I'm going to describe a little bit about the role that these actors play um, uh, in this system, and then I'm going to propose two research frameworks to explore the impact of of, of the relationship between these actors. Uh, and finally, if, if time permits, I'm going to give you an example from my own previous research, a, a study that I performed, in which I kind of thought about this framework initially and and did created all the method for data collection and data analysis based on this thing. Now, there has been a lot of work uh, done by, you know, by research, by previous researchers about the role that algorithms have in the distribution of media. Uh, and previous work in this space has focused on measurements and, and measurements of how impactful algorithms have been in the media availability for the public, right? There's previous work that focused on the frequency of representation of sources or content. How often does, does a type of content appears or a type of source of content appears? Um, a lot of work have, has been done trying to measure partisan or ideological biases in the content that is um, distributed by these algorithmic platforms. Uh, now, there has been a lot of discussion about how to define uh, bias in uh, either partisan or the ideological. A lot of it is focused on the United States and its understanding of a uh, of a of a of a one-dimensional scale of liberals to conservatives. And I myself has done have done a lot of studies based. Uh, a lot of my work is also based in that in that dichotomy that is very American based. Uh, so I think it's more challenging to think about. Um, biases that are either outside of ideology or partisanship, or even outside of partisan partisanship or ideology in the American sense, right? The literature has been progressing in that regard, but a lot of it is American focused. Um, there has been some research that try to focus on where the bias can come from, including the role of the user input. And that's kind of what I try to take a crack at. Um, thinking about this specific framework. Um, and some of work also has been done trying to get into personalization, right? A lot of the work, a lot of the algorithms that are out there are, are about personalizing content to specific users and, and their needs uh, and, and, and preferences. So there has been a lot of work in trying to measure how deep that personalization goes. Um, and trying to also contrast it with customization, which is this idea that uh, the user has some power in defining what type of content they're gonna, they're gonna see, right? What I argue here is for a wider interpretation of curation in these algorithmic media, looking not only at the algorithm or the users in isolation, but also looking at the intersections in that curation process between algorithmic mediators, the actions of the users, and even the availability of content provided by publishers or creators. So what do I actually mean when I talk about actors, right? Who are these actors in this curation system? Well, the first one and the most uh, prevalent, the pro most prominent, the one that people most talk about is the algorithm itself. Of course, algorithm here is a word that encompasses a lot, right? Uh, but these can be kind of understood as a wide variety of systems with different goals and techniques to create, to curate content in digital platforms, right? Um, this has been the focus, this, this central element of it, which is a technical um, uh, actor, um, has been the focus of much discussion, much cultural hype, uh, much, um, you know, controversy, uh, even mystique, right? We, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's frequent that people talk about the algorithm as if it's something almost human that has will um, and agency, right? Um, and, and it's more complex than that, obviously. We know that biases can emerge from these algorithms themselves as they make their uh, choices that are actually human defined 
and and coded into mass, but that mass is based on human values and human choices, right? Um, and a lot has been said and studied about the potential harms caused by algorithms in the distribution of media. There has been a lot of talk about filter bubbles uh, and how uh, it increases polarization and things like that. Um, and, um, and, and there's also been a lot of work at, at, at how the human developers can embed their biases or embed their bias, biases through the ways that these algorithms are trained, right? Um, there is a new turn in these algorithms now that is again, very much hyped, which is the generative AI or the large language models. Um, there are different words to describe this, but basically is uh, this new generation of tools that is generating content um, might not be a good, a good reprodu reproduction of truth, as we have seen uh, in the brittleness of these systems and how they work. But uh, now they have been seen as uh, additional tools for curation of media because some search engines are now adopting them um, as interfaces for, for the content that they want to curate, right? Um, now, a lot has been said about algorithms, but there are still opportunities to study the degree in which these algorithms are sensitive and dependent of the input of the users, um, and sometimes even limited by the availability of content that they have they, that they can extract. Even for large language models, um, there has been some discussion about where that language comes from. What is the cor corpus that extracts it and how um, and how it extracts it and whether or not it, it extracts only the format of, of that media but it whether or not it, it it accurately extracts the underlying facts that that media um, represents right then we have the audience which is, as I said is now classified as the users since they're not only consuming media and re receiving it but using systems that curate it, right? They are uh, pitched as part of communities when it comes to social media, but they're also recipients. Um, and, and they use the affordances of search, uh, search engines and social media and things like that um, to gather the content or to receive the content that they use. So they have a more active role than just switching the channel or subscribing to another newspaper. Um, when it comes to user, a lot of the research has focused on um, using and updating traditional media theories of the 20th century, like selective exposure theories uh, uh, and things like that. Um, and also studying how algorithms can reinforce or counteract these individual level biases in media selection, right? So it's about a lot of it, uh, when it focuses on the users and the audience in these platform systems, uh, it tends to focus a lot on, uh, on or our, our old understandings of media selection and how the, how the algorithms, the search and social media particularly, can feed into uh, the, these ideas of media selections that you used to have. Um, other works have focused on the potential benefits of harm or harms of personalization and customization to the internal mechanisms of people, like the polarization or political uh, alignments that people might have, right? So it tends to be more personal to the users, right? Um, there is a lot, another strand of research that is more uh, human computer interaction, more in the computer science side that has um, focused a lot on, on how people actually use these systems and how they bypass uh, some affordances of the, these systems. There is also uh, research in, in communication sciences about that as well, communication studies about that as well. Um, but there, again, there is more uh, opportunities out there to study these things in connection to the systems and in connection to the content that they, that they have more than just internally, uh, internal decisions that they might make. Finally, we have the content Creators. And one of the claims that I make 
uh, in this essay is that this actor in particular is underexplored. It's an underexplored element in the algorithmic media curation, um, the supply side of it, the body of work that is available for the algorithm to extract and curate and select and provide to the users, right? The role of algorithms in media selection, whether it's search or social media, um, is to supply users with relevant media. And they make that selection based on media inventories that are very large, but can be limited, right? Nowadays, it's very easy to think that content is infinite, but it really isn't. For instance, news media doesn't supply an infinite variety of news articles for every event, right? There's a lot of perspectives that are missing because of the economic structure of news media, right? There's not, not all inputs are out there, right? Um, platforms such as like search and social media, they can also restrict what type of media they even have available to extract based on some previous filtering criteria. For instance, Google um, rates websites based on their quality. It has a metric for quality of website, right? So that removes a lot of the potential content that Google can, 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 uh, can extract uh, from, from the main corpus. And in fact, we have seen that some um, political actors have been making use of that by creating high quality websites with content that might be misinforming so that when you search for something on Google, your that all, that website is the only thing that they see. So they use those gaps in, in, in the in the corpus uh, that Google calls from to kind of maintain some control of the information, right? Um, so these criteria of selections and reducing the corpus of it can be conduits for biases as well, right? Um, and even some other algorithmic media platforms such as streaming services. You know, you have streaming services that kind of show you what show you should watch next. They obviously have a very limited inventory based on the licenses that they have for content and the content that they themselves produce. So there are wider business limitations for the content that is, that is, that is produced. So as we see, uh, just by describing uh, the actors in this algorithmic media curation system makes it kind of hard to disentangle one from the other, right? The algorithm is shaped by the values imbu imbued in it by the, its designers, but also by the needs of the users who are, you know, selecting by searching for specific keywords or by following specific people, um, and the opportunities that the source media has, right? The, the corpus that, that media provides to that algorithm. The users help shape the curated media and response to the algorithm, um, you know, as they search for the content that they, they look for, right? So they are interacting with the algorithms, right? Uh, the available content is shaped by the needs of the user, but as they are refracted through the pressures of the algorithm, right? So uh, a, a, a media, uh, organization. Uh, let's again use the, the example of news media. Uh, news media has an idea of what the news is, but also has to consider what the what their readers want, but also have to consider what the algorithm responds well to, right? So this is a system that is shaped by a lot of flows and feedback loops, right? Um, and in fact, again, this is a simplification. The, the the, the the complex system looks more like this, right? Because there is like feedback loops and pushbacks and things like that. And each actor is actually a series of individual actors, uh, of, of itemized actors within it, you know, because within uh, the users, we have the regular readers, we have regulators, politicians, we have researchers, we have influencers who, who are then content producers. Within the content producers, we have the reporters, but we also have the editors, we have the PR people, we have advertisers, 
uh, they're all within that pressure point of, of, of the content producers. And algorithms, there's a wide variety of algorithms and a wide variety of companies that create these algorithms and a wide variety of roles within these companies. So, right? so this system can be very much more complex. But one thing that I that the essay and and I kind of am going to try to do forever now is always consider these uh, points in which one meta actor is interacting with the other and how how that interaction can be tense and uh, and I flesh out that tension by thinking about these two proposed frameworks of studying these systems. And the, the two proposed frameworks are values and power. And what do I mean by that, right? By power, I mean, who shapes that curation? Who has more power to shape the end curation of that media, right? Uh, power is here is each actor's ability to shape that algorithm curation. Now, this power varies according to the type of platform, right? So a search engine is triggered by the user, including some keywords, right? And the user might have more power because they're shaping the, the initial curation of that thing. Uh, social media platforms, um, in social media platforms, the user chooses who to follow. Um, and the algorithm has some power to suggest things uh, but the power is enacted by different ways, right? Um, and the, the variabilities here are not only with the type of platform, but also by individual platforms as well. Different search engines might have different sensitivities to keywords. Uh, different social media platforms might nudge new accounts to follow more often, right? Um, you know, TikTok uh, is pushing you more content more quickly than things like, I don't know, um, Reddit or, or even Twitter or even Facebook. Um, so the power of each actor to shape curatorial bias, I think it's ripe for more investigations, even though it has been the focus of a lot of investigations as well. But I think if we frame it as that, uh, we can kind of glimpse a little bit more about in a more critical way about not just like what, whether or not an algorithm is good or bad, but how an algorithm is responding to which pressures, right? Um, so these investigations need to be cognizant, cog, cognizant, cognizant of the complexity of the system and accounting for these responsibilities, including what each platform sets out to do, right? Both as a type of platform like search or search, social media or a specific platform like a brand, right? Like a, a, a company. Um, so the other um, approach that I, that I suggest is the issue of values. And here the question is, do the different actors share this, the same values, right? How congruent are the values between these actors in this interaction? And where do they conflict? For instance, um, again, bringing back to news, which is kind of the thing that I do, right? Um, there might be a conflict between the journalistic values of news organizations, of newspapers and news websites and news portals, and the value that a platform might have, right? A value that a social media platform might have, because there the value is engagement and clicks, and maybe for journalistic values is social relevance or some, uh, or at least, I mean, I know that I'm being a little bit naive when I say that uh, you know, news media only focuses about social relevance, but at least outwardly, that's what they might be interested in. And so how those <coughs> values connect with each other and, and, and resist each other, it might be interesting. There's also the values in news media of what are the values of the, the readers? What do they expect from news media? Which may be different from what news media expects from itself and may be different from what algorithms take out of news media, right? Um, so this is a part of, uh, this is a way of thinking about values that is about um, that sentence is where you sit is where you stand. Your job kind of makes you uh, have specific values 
facing the world. Uh, but there are other differences in value, right? Like the, a lot of these platforms are created in the United States, uh, widely used in the United States, but also widely used in other countries. So there might be conflicts of local cultures and values with the cultures and values of Silicon Valley in determining what is important or, or harmful content, right? Just uh, this week in Brazil, which is my home country, we had some tension between the civil society and the government and uh, Twitter, because we had some unfortunate attacks on schools and the civil society of Brazil has debated this throughout this week. And they, again, we need research to see whether or not how, how, how plausible this is. But they identify that one of the problems might be a social media sharing of content that is related to school attacks that might create mystique around them, that might create copycats, right? Um, and the government then reached out to Twitter, which is one of the platforms in which this content was, was being shared and asked, you know, can we do something about it? Can we extract, can we increase moderation for this? And Twitter's response was, well, no, because it's freedom of speech, right? Oh, it, it's part of the, their idea of, of freedom of speech that is embedded in them because it is the United States culture of freedom of speech, which is different from the freedom of speech culture in Brazil. So it's an it's a it's a ongoing tension that is happening this week, but it has been happening for years now and will continue to happen. These differences of local values, right? Um, even commercial values uh, can be different, right? You have news organizations that are subscription oriented, other that that are ad revenue based, right? What is the what is the value of the algorithm there? I mean, it is to not only have ads, but also retain the most amount of revenue that they can have, right? So there is a type of research that can emerge from examining the Congress or the difference of values from each actors. And I think it's, it's methodologically, I think more interesting here would be a mixed methods approach uh, more than a qualitative or quantitative approach to this, right? Um, so from this, these two per critical perspectives of power and values, uh, we can explore some specific social and technical uh, manifestations of the interplay between these actors. And again, this is when you, now every time that I read a paper about algorithmic uh, uh, media creation. I, I always think about these frameworks, even, you know, I, you know, previous papers, older papers, and I also say, is this about the pa power of each actor to, to, to change it, or is it about the, the difference of values? And sometimes the values are almost embedded in the questions that we ask, right? A lot of research about um, whether or not algorithms are good for polarization, right? Say, well, we should have some diversity, in, in the content that these algorithms provide. Well, that's a value that, that you're embedded in it, right? It's part of a tradition that diversity of viewpoints is good, but it, and it might be you know, valid or not, but it is a value that you're embedded in as a researcher, right? So for me, it's much more interesting to think about what are the expected values from each actor than trying to imbue that research question with a specific value that comes from literature or something like that. So I want to give a note here, uh, which is not really described in that, uh, in that forum, uh, in, in the essay that I published in this forum, but it, but it is important methodologically, which is, which is this issue of transparency, right? Um, in fact, when we look at this complex social techno te techno technical system of algorithms and curation, we can't really see all of it, right? What usually happens is something like this. Uh, we can certainly talk to users through surveys or interviews 
or using even you know, uh, digital exhaust data. Uh, we can certainly talk to news media and they might be a little bit reticent about you know, being completely forthcoming about their business practices and et cetera, but they, they are very keen to talking about their values for sure. And I've experienced that as a researcher, but the algorithm itself is usually behind secrecy. Unless you are working from within the system, um, you're not gonna have access to, to how it works. One big exception to that is, you know, whatever's happening on Twitter right now, uh, we, we got a glimpse of, of its code and how they, um, how, they, um, how they favor some content on the, uh, uh, or, or the other. Um, I'm not gonna go into the dynamics of what made them share that code. I think it's, I mean, we are all uh, kind of cognizant of uh, the weirdness that is happening at, at Twitter right now, but it, this time was a good weirdness for us. But usually what we have is what we call a black box around these algorithms. <laughs> and it is hard to overcome that uh, because every method that we can choose to kind of highlight or show what is happening in these platforms uh, comes against this lack of transparency. Now, there are different ways of getting around it and none of them are perfect. Um, I tend to ascribe to this idea that we have to try as much as we can to replicate a naturalistic usage of an algorithmic system, but also being fully transparent um, with the limitations of that. There, there are, uh, for instance, when we're auditing uh, search engines, there are different ways in which we can simulate that. And the idea here is that we can input data into the system and measure the data that is output uh, from the system and try to compare both and contrast them with our expectations of what it does, right? Um, there is a challenge in personalization. We don't know how far, I mean, research has tried to measure that and measure that uh, and found that personalization for some topics and some circumstances can be very minimal. So we can extract information from, from, this, from these simulated systems, even though uh, people always ask about how do you account for personalization? Um, there, are, there are other ways in which that are more costly, uh, like um, enlisting hundreds or thousands of users to either supply uh, access to their content or to install some sort of widget in their browser that collects all that content. Um, then you run up against a bunch of problems like Recruiting, recruiting and cost and who are you recruiting and biases in that, that recruitment as well. Um, so it is a challenge that has no easy answers, uh, but um, we have to account for that as well, right? We have to do the best that we can and, and, and account for the limitations of that, right? And sometimes it's not even that limiting based on the claims that you want to make from that audit. Now, hopefully, I think I'm nearing my time here. I can speak more about specific examples of how I operationalize this, this, this framework. Uh, but hopefully what I hope to uh, discuss here is that algorithmic media curation is a complex social technical system that includes different actors with, whose motivations, pressures, and values um, influence that curation, right? And my claim is that we should delineate the more complex relationships within that system to not deify the algorithm and not um, individualize the individual, but instead think of it as this bigger structure that has pushes and pulls that change over time, right? And I hope that the two lenses to analyze that interplay, which is power and values, can be valuable uh, for, for future research as well. So that's what I had to say, and I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to answer your questions 
or talk more about my specific research as well. Thank you so much, Daniel. This was like awesome, really. And I just want to remind the audience that you can submit your question, introduce your question in the Q&A button, which is down the screen. Uh, but I would like to start with a question. So I was thinking about uh, independent creators, um, like normal people outside mainstream media outlets, digital media outlets. And I was thinking about how would algorithms somehow impact their works? Um, if it gives more or less visibility or if, you know, it has any an impact at all in their work, in the way they produce, in the way they develop. Um, if you could develop a little bit on that, would be great. Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, this is, again, I'm, I'm re-showing here my um, simplification, right, of the systems. But in fact, uh, what, we, what we can call as influencers or content producers that are not within a formal business perspective, they, are both users and content producers, but in their role as of content producers, they have also uh, business concerns and labor concerns and even psychological concerns about that labor as well, right? Um, I don't study that specifically, but I would say that they are very much pressured by the signals that they receive from algorithms, right? the amount of likes and shares, right? And, and that amount of likes and shares actually dictate how much money they make from advertising partners or whether or not they can even join that market of, of advertising partners, right? So I would say that these content producers are very much aware of the signals that they see. And sometimes they're, I mean, they're, most times they're much more aware of specificities in the algorithms that they work with than researchers really. Right? I see myself often looking at, um, I mean, this is not about social media. My focus is more uh, on search. So I see myself often looking at blogs from SEO people, right? Search engine optimization people. And there's a lot of blogs about them and they're very, uh, specific about things like, oh, what, what's the best time of day to make sure that you're being crawled by the search engine or what tags you should use and stuff like that, how the headline should be written and things like that. So they are very much aware, um, even, even when they're not part of a big organization and often more so than big organizations about what works for the algorithms or not. So they're always uh, thinking back on the, on the language that I use here, right? They're always very sensitive to the signals that the algorithm provides to them in this, in this back and forth, in this loop, right? They're thinking about their users and their fan base and their followers, but they're also constantly thinking about what the algorithm provides to them. Well, I posted this photo at 8 a.m. So Maybe next time I'll try at 1 p.m. and, and it's going to go better or something like that. Right. Great, Daniel. Thank you so much. And I think that Facundo now has a question. Uh, thank you, Dai. Uh, thank you, Daniel. It was truly, truly wonderful. Uh, thank you also for the clarity in explaining these very complex uh, concepts. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about like this very uh, a slide that that you mentioned at the beginning of of the presentation, like this before and and now mm -hmm. scenario, and I'm curious about because in this before scenario we used to have like we used to have like curation between content producers and readers, maybe yeah. done by other sort of actors as editors, mm -hmm. and also we used to have like feedback loop based on different measures that mm -hmm. newspapers used to have from audiences. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think in the middle, like before the algorithm era, like the era of like analytics, for instance, mm -hmm. a way of 
which like newsrooms get a lot of information from from readers and from audiences. Mm -hmm. How do you see like in this sort of like genealogy, like mm -hmm. the role of algorithm basis specifically on this like direction on like what happened like this in this scenario of before, mm -hmm. what happened like immediately after algorithm in this era of like digitalization mm -hmm. and what what is specificity specificities do you think that algorithm have that doesn't have like the, the before area in terms of like curation and power and values dimension that you mentioned that right? Now, it's a very interesting question. It's one that I'm thinking about a lot. And, and I think about it a lot for future studies that I've done and an A study that I've completed, an interview study with journalists that I've done and I'm, and I'm preparing it for submission. Um, I think the biggest change from what I've gathered, both as a journalist working in a newsroom while these things were emerging and as someone who talked to a bunch of journalists throughout and someone who interviewed a bunch of journalists for research is that it's not even the technical aspect. It's more of the, the curation is outside of our organization aspect. That is the most jarring aspect of this. So there is the technical aspect of the immediacy, right? Of, these metrics are coming in immediately. We post something and immediately we know whether or not it's working or not. Um, but there's also this element of now our editor is outside our walls. It's in a computer server somewhere in Silicon Valley or some big server somewhere. And that curation is being done outside of our control and therefore outside our values as well, right? So somewhere out there is deciding whether or not our content is being seen by the audiences or not. Now, there has always been in journalism, at least, and in separate and in, in, in a variety of media, um, certainly films and television, uh, TV shows and television, uh, there has always been the tension of whether or not we should supply the audience with what they think they want or what we think they need. Right, that tension has always been there. It's on, if you watch Citizen Kane, it's on Citizen Kane, right? Um, so in news media, that's very, because journalists are very annoying and like to talk about things, uh, that has always been very clear, right? Oh, we should, this should be the headline because it's important for society, um, or this should be the headline because people want to read about this. Not always it's a, it's the same type of story, right? So some news organizations pride themselves or used to be proud of the fact that, no, we're not gonna do what the audience thinks they want. We're gonna shove them with the content that we think that they should read because it's important for us, it's our journalistic value that they should read this very dry story about Congress instead of the more cultural, um, effusive story that they might want to read about some celebrity doing something, right? Uh, and it is again about values, right? It is about the values that you want to imbue in your communication. Now, when the algorithms came in as external editors, um, there was tension, more tension. That level of tension even increased because now the question is do we, there is a business element to a, a more poignant business element and a more immediate business element into providing, making that choice. Uh, and there's more clarity on what kind of content hits or not. And that decision, that distribution is being done by this ex, these external forces, right? So you see the rise of clickbait, um, um, headlines that are geared toward, um, innate curiosity, but also geared toward the algorithm, right? Um, because they want to encourage click through. They want to encourage things like that, that are signal, there are technical signals to the algorithm. Um, and even traditional news media organizations or outlets have adopted things like clickbait in the beginning, right? Then other news, other entities started to more deeply consider what they could do with the algorithm and how to mesh 
the algorithm's needs with the user's needs or the audience needs and the news organization's wants or needs, right? So you see some real reflection nowadays between journalists in which they try to marry the values of the algorithm and their journalistic values, right? But I think what happened was it, it, it generated an increase of that tension to the point that different outlets made different decisions how to deal with that tension. Um, and that was, that was interesting. And now we're at a point that the algorithm is there, right? The, this external editor is part of the ecosystem. Uh, you know, journalism students in journalism schools already know about that and already know how to deal with that and already having discussions about that. Um, and the problem now is the inconstance, how inconsistent the, the, the algorithms, the algorithmic platforms can be, right? And we, we're seeing that with Twitter right now, right? Oh, we gear toward um, being on Twitter in this way, and now Twitter is changing the way that they are. So how do we adapt to that? That is the big problem now, I think. Thank you. Okay. So I think that Catalina now has a question. Do you want to go, Cata? Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel, for this wonderful presentation. I really learned a lot about this right now. So maybe it's a follow-up of Facundo question in your answer right there right now, because I'm, I also work as a journalist in Chile, so I have a background in that, and I live the, the, in the environment that you need to produce news that it will produce clicks in the website. Mm -hmm. And it was really difficult at the moment to adapt the quality of the news that you wanted to produce or what audience wanted to consume. Mm -hmm. And then I see that in maybe it's in Latin America Academy, there's no mm -hmm. like a consistency of what is happening with algorithm and what they mm -hmm. are teaching you in the classroom. Mm -hmm. How do you see that we can fix this because you are creating journalism, journalists that are going to work as a journalist, but they have mm -hmm. like the typical who, when, what, and that's like how do you need to produce news, but in the real world is completely different. Mm -hmm. How do we train journalists for the next decades? Yeah, and how, right. yeah. Um, I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, I think what we have to do is get to the foundationals of why we do journalism and how we do it. Um, maybe you can question how we do it. Um, I am somewhat opposed, I'm somewhat, not opposed, but reticent um, as to teaching specific platforms. I mean, we, we see it all the time, like, oh, here's a new class for TikTok journalism. Well, TikTok might be banned in the United States. How, what are we gonna do with that knowledge, right? But there is an efficiency or an efficacy in using the platforms as they are right now to train um, future journalists how to do specific things. And so instead of TikTok journalism is short video journalism, right? So being aware of the, 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 the fact that these platforms are gonna change and are gonna go away and new platforms are gonna come up. What can we keep from our journalistic values and understandings that is immutable and for me, the core of it is the search for truth. It's not even objectivity. It's just the search for truth, right? Uh, objectivity is a goal towards truth. Um, transparency, community, listening, reacting. Those are the, the roles that journalists should have. And those roles can be done in a variety of platforms. Right. But also, I think we should be prepared both as journalism scholars or journalists or journalists in training or trainers of journalists um, to fight back, to push back, right? Um, when, when NPR got a label for uh, state-funded uh, media by Twitter, they've decided that they're not going to participate in Twitter anymore. And that has a cost. It has a very big cost. Not as big commercially, because Twitter actually doesn't direct that much traffic to news websites, but
but it has a social cost, a political cost to not be part of a conversation, right? Um, but it is a choice that is imbued in the values of NPR. Right? The values of NPR say, the way that this platform stands right now, we cannot be part of it. Right? And we can discuss whether or not that label is accurate or not, but it was very clear that that, that label was put there as a political repercussion for something that the, the owner of that platform didn't, didn't want, right? So there is a immutable truth and value in journalism that is not gonna change depending on the external algorithmic curators that, that are there. Um, and part of that immutable truth is also that we should always be critical and even be critical of the systems that support us. Right. Journalism is aspirational by heart. Every day, every news edition that we send out to the presses in, in the old thing that used to be you know, print journalism is in a sense a failure. It's a failure to really accurately describe the world or really, or really powerfully change the world meaningfully. But there is always the aspiration of the next edition to be a little bit better, right? So having that critical eye, I think it's more important than specific um, platforms to teach. And we also obviously wanna teach techniques, but, but that's it. There's a specific truth that is more solid than anything else. Thank you. No problem. So now our last question is from Val. Yes, thank you so much for such an insightful presentation, Professor Chaley. It's great to see you again, even if it's uh, on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, when considering the levels of awareness content creators now have both around the needs of the user and the demands of the algorithm, I'm wondering how the values within this process really remain true to these factors or deviate from the expectations of what these should be? especially as content creation now is rooted in very calculated considerations for production mm -hmm. distribution and just mm -hmm. the various considerations within cycles of media attention. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Yeah, I mean, as I said, I've been talking to journalists about this for a study that I've done. And the interesting thing is that, you know, I asked them, um, you know, how do you, who do you work for, right? Like not with these words, but basically, who do you write for? Is it for the audience or for the algorithm? And some of them are very resistant to say, no, I always think about my audience and people try to bother me with SEO things and how to write better headlines. And sometimes I, I agree, but I don't really like it, right? Other people say, no, unfortunately we have to cater to the algorithms or else nobody's gonna read us. But one interesting emerging thing is that a lot of, journalists in particular, because I mean, I talk about journalists because that's where the research that I've done, but I, I'm sure that this happens with other type of media as well, is that they are now reflecting on how both the algorithm values and the audience values, or at least the values that they ascribe to the audience can be connected to each other, can be the same, right? So yeah, I don't want to do clickbait, but I do want to be read. Right. It is important that people read what I have to say about this stupid city council meeting because it is not stupid, it's actually impactful to society. So how can I do it in a way that is that people are going to read it? Because then I'm going to fulfill my journalistic value of having an impact in the world. Right. Um, another example is, yeah, the, the algorithm really doesn't like complicated words. Right, I shouldn't put complicated words in my text or my headlines or my titles or whatever. Um, but really, if you think about it, we shouldn't really put complicated words in text because if I do, it's going to, you know, remove some readers from from the people that might be reading. So they're trying to reflect. There are some journalists now trying to reflect on how the algorithms value marry into their journalistic values as well, because then you can also delineate. Right? Oh, I'll do this, but not this. This matches what my values, but this doesn't. And this is how it kind of like they protect the quality of the content as well. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel, for a terrific seminar. Uh, very, very interesting perspective um, and very broad. Uh, field. And thank you, Tayani, for great moderation. Uh, thank you to our audience for staying with us through the end. And I want to wish everybody a great rest of your day and week, uh, or days and weeks, and uh, invite you to join us for the next iteration of this virtual seminar series. Once again, thank you, Daniel, for sharing your work with us. It was terrific. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure, as always. My pleasure. Bye now. Bye.